so yeah i guess today we'll talk about a bunch of things um i have a couple of topics in mind actually um one has to do with uh, the connection between wick rotations and um how you can develop connection between quantum field theories quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics and um uh, the whole idea of propagators and uh, uh yeah all all of these things will be coming in so that is one direction uh, in which uh, i'm planning to go uh second thing is um there's this really interesting thing i came across which is known as uh, gauge theory gravity which is casting general relativity in the language of geometric algebra also known as clifford algebra and um yeah i i know very little about this but i found some interesting resources that you can probably go through so um, i guess we can start off with that and see where things lead us yeah that's good yeah um so i guess we'll start off with uh with rotation yeah with rotations mm, let's see so uh, i think on our confirmable bootstrap video i briefly mentioned this of um, how the um, the partition function in the icing model can be viewed as uh, um, a, a path integral basically a discretized version of path integral and mm -hmm. i said oh this connects back to uh, the whole idea of wick rotation now like why do we do wick rotations because it makes our integrals uh, easier to deal with or we're looking at different things um, we can even change uh, from the lorentzian integral into uh, the euclidean and this allows us to do many things uh, on its own so essentially like um, uh, what i think we're trying to do is um uh, you have the lorentzian uh, signature yeah. uh, of the metric and that has like one odd sign flip mm. sign compared mm. to the others mm. and i think like um, in order to um deal with that sign per se mm. Mm. Uh, uh in the sense how is the sign defined it is defined on the space of two form so when you have t s square you have like minus uh, this yeah. thing right? and then plus 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 right yeah. uh, so uh, what you do is so in fact like the the rotations are not really happening in i mean the rotations are not really like uh, help uh, helping with uh, two uh, i mean the linear calculations but it actually simplifies the uh, calculations in the two form space so in yeah. the sense you just have a additive or like a homogeneous like uh, kind of signature yeah yeah but the primary reason why we actually started doing this was um when you take feynman diagrams right um hmm. you have um um these loop calculations uh, which actually diverge more many times and almost, they almost always diverge yeah almost Very always to get a finite loop attribute exactly yeah but using this specific trick you can actually tackle so many integrals and that's why we brought this in yeah so i want to just add one more thing this is more of a comment okay but like yeah. objectively just when you do a calculation all of equation looks like is quite literally a transform like literally you're doing is like what is called a quote unquote u substitution all you're doing is just you're changing variables yeah yeah right Yeah, but in essence, it's such a deep concept. Yeah, because effectively, what you're doing is when you're switching from a metric which has a negative sign to a metric which is all positive, like you're going from Binkowski space to Euclidean space. One of the key things you're doing is that, like, you're going from a space that is non-compact to a space that, like, in which if you switch to spherical spherical coordinates, you get like something that's compact, and like that is that is a thing that's something very deep that. I don't know if that has any physical consequences or not, but like the fact that like just the transformation of integral does like such a fundamental shift in the metric you're integrating over, I think that's something that's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and also like a lot of integrals which have which are divergent in this thing, in Minkowski space, or rather not, I don't want to say divergent, 
which are not as nicely convergent in Minkowski space become much more nicely convergent in Euclidean space. Right. Um, because you deal with a lot of complex exponentials. So having a negative sign means like one thing is positive and the others are negative, right? Like, of course, the negative exponentials eventually dominate, but you have that annoying positive exponential that messes up a lot of things you're doing. Oh. But when you switch to Euclidean space, when you do the Wick rotation, everything becomes a negative exponential. So everything converges much more nicely. Yeah. Uh, so uh, when you talk about a convergence, like uh, when you try to like uh, make or uh, something an integral that is divergent in a particular space, and you're try trying to define uh, a sp another space of like the same order, like or the same dimensionality, uh, but you're trying to make that integral converge, right? I think what you do is like mostly it has to do with some sort of compactification. Because you're eliminating. No, but then, if you're compactified, you're not solving the same integral, are you? Yeah. You're not just completely changing the problem. Right? Okay. So, the thing is, like, so... ideally, like, if you're dealing with a physical system and if something's diverging and you're going to okay. switch to make it converge, then, like, you're doing something weird. Ideally, what should happen is that in your final calculation, when dealing with anything observable, like, here's the thing it's okay to have divergences in the middle steps of your calculation as long as by the final step, all the divergences mutually cancel out. That is one of the really, really powerful aspects of quantum field theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, it has all, like, we haven't come across a calculation yet where mm -hmm. any of the particle cross sections are explicitly divergent. But okay, uh, so but still, you're giving um, an extra space for your divergent uh, terms to cancel out exactly, right? You're not creating so an extra sense? space though. Like okay, like a typical technique that is very often used is your dimensional regularization, right? What you're mm -hmm. doing there is like in an intermediate step to to like kind of quantify how badly divergent things are. You go to four minus two epsilon dimension, but at the very end of the calculation, you said epsilon equal to zero again. So like, you're not ignoring your divergence, you're acknowledging it in a form that's more handleable. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, just to uh, look at a few resources on this, I found this actually really uh, interesting resource, I would say. Um, I can just share it with you guys. Uh, let's try to see what this guy is doing. So it calls this quantropy. Okay. Uh, yeah. So basically what he tries to do here is bring in some sort of an equivalence between the Boltzmann distribution and um, uh, the action, Feynman action. Uh, and um, yeah, he brings in a lot of parallels between uh, uh, classical dynamics, statistical mechanics, and quantum mechanics. Um, so yeah, you can probably we can probably start going through the abstract here. Um, we, yeah, we give a formula something for something called the quantropy. We recover Feynman's formula from assuming uh, histories over histories have complex amp amplitudes, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Okay. Before we go deeper into this paper, I want to touch it with just one quick thing. Is that yeah. one? There's a thing about how statistical mechanics is effectively quantum field theory in zero plus one dimensions, I think. Right. right. Oh, you can probably bring up. Uh, th th that is, yeah. I I'm not super sure of this, but there's something like that. But also, like, when you just typically study statistical mechanics, right? Yeah. Like, there are just so many aspects of like things you do in QFT that come in. Right. And that's quite simply because, like, they both kind of aim to do the same thing. You're dealing with very large numbers of degrees of freedom. Right. Like, one of the things you do in, um, in, quant in uh, StatMec to study like a system of like interacting particles is you do something called a cluster expansion. Yeah. Which looks extremely, extremely similar to how the entire perturbative expansion and extracting Feynman diagrams works out. So yeah. like the, the similarities are all there to be seen. Yeah. I think, I think StatMec and um, TFT are like kind of like top down, bottom up approaches if you actually uh, try to think about it. Uh, how is how does QFT start? It starts by assuming some, some sort of repeat and like uh, imposing quantization rules and seeing how the algebra go and all that. Mm -hmm. But whereas so that so makes like... Can I just, okay, uh, they start from exactly the same place. Where do you start a quantum field theory for? You start from either a Lagrangian or a Hamiltonian, right? 
Where mm-hmm. do you start statistical mechanics from? The partition function. What is the partition function? A functional of your Hamiltonian. You're starting from the exact same place. Yeah. So essentially talking about the same stuff. And um, let's see where. Yeah. So he brings in these. Um, they bring in these uh, parallels between uh, the statistics and quantum dynamics. So. Yeah, this is an interesting thing uh, that we can go through. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, this is one of the things. In the uh, sense, one second. Yeah. So in the sense, basically, what I got from the summarized, uh, in like a brief glance at, at the paper, is like in mm. uh, quantum mechanics, whatever your uncertainty is. Hmm. Um, it actually contains your essence of your dynamics. Yeah, in some I mean, sort of like. I mean, yeah, even he views it as a like the um, the action, uh, the e to the power i s uh, uh, h bar, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Um, it's a complexified version of your uh, Boltzmann distribution, is uh, how he views it, uh, or they view it. Uh, John Lake. So, so in the sense, like, um, yeah, so your phase space in quantum mechanics, right? Yeah, yeah. That becomes like uh, the I'm hidden sorry, really value. Here. I think I want to take a, yeah, yeah. The stable is pretty good. Cool. Okay, paused. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. you guys thing. can keep discussing it. I just yeah. want to look at the table. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, yeah. so, uh, yeah, so the phase space. Uh, it corresponds to like um, a set of differential e- uh, solutions to the differential equations that like um, talk about the same thing, mm. and then that actually, if you actually in uh, like it, when it comes to dynamics, uh, you kind of like have this same thing, right? The concept is you're uh, talking about a phase which is a solution for your differential equations, and then when you actually want to take a trajectory through the dynamics, like you impose another condition, and then you uh, like yeah, or like boundary conditions and stuff, and then you figure out the actual dynamics of the uh, system. Hmm. But uh, so I think like yeah, so statistical mechanics with the sp- uh, phase space um, gets converted to uh, dynamics. I mean, mm. statistics um, with the state space is converted to uh, dynamics, mm. and I think that is that is probably how he tries to bring about um, this kind of analogy. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, I think I missed out a little bit, but like when you say, so you can always define a phase space for any statistics system you have. If you want something to be dynamical, then you need dynamical terms in your energy function. Right. Yeah. Like, like it's the same. Like you can just write down any interaction, but then like, like let's let's take QFT for instance, right? Like if I don't have a D mu psi, D mu psi, if I just have an M psi bar psi, like that's kind of a very very useless theory. Yeah. Yeah. So like a non dynamical theory is well, I don't want to say useless. It's a good toy model, but it's not going to correspond to like you can't really do anything with it. Like yeah. you can't measure things. So. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, so this is uh, an interesting read as well. But yeah, there's uh, more to this picture. Um, yeah, I'm really fascinated by this paper. This is yeah. really really cool. This is something out really out there, I would say. Um, but yeah, yeah, it uh, pays to uh, go through it. We can probably like uh, attach a link to this on the podcast. Yep. 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 Uh, we can do that. Uh, okay, I'll just stop share. Um, yeah, so uh, another thing that uh, I guess we can go around. Uh, do you guys, did you guys come across anything fun? Um, wait, what? Ah, okay. Um, share Neil. Yeah, sure. Anything fun? Well. Uh, there are can, always fun things uh, going on, right? Like, okay, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just no, I'm just making note of the time. Don't worry, we can yeah, yeah, just same. cut yeah, it. Yeah, same. Me too. Um, yeah. Cut, cut, cut. <laughs> okay, so um, do you actually, you know, because they're going to be editing, do you want to switch to talking about? I don't know. Like, do you want to go to the Jones polynomial now, or do you want to do that later? Yeah, we can do it. 
Jones polynomial. Uh, then one of you have to go ahead with that. Sir. Okay. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. Pratyush, are you ready now? All right. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, Do it after I clap so you know where to cut. I'll, I'll make note of the time. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. Go. Okay. So, um, essentially, when the one more thing that we can start talking about is the Jones polynomial because uh, I started looking up on this um uh, on Ed Witten's like um quite famous paper that connects Jones poly- polynomials to uh, KFT and mm-hmm. uh you know that was one of the leading like papers that like actually connected like um you know uh this string theory to not theory and like um uh, yeah it, it just brought this whole thing it was a quite famous um revolution in physics but any anyway to try to understand I, I, I was trying to understand what jones polynomials are mm. and in order to do that you first have to go back to not theory and what exactly not are so uh so in summation uh this was the idea right so uh you uh to define a knot in three dimensions okay mm-hmm. by the way you can't define a knot in like higher dimension because yeah. the moment you go to fourth dimension you can easily like untie any knot like but yeah. um using the set of rules right so uh, you you're, you're only you can like uh, you can't really like pass the you, you, you have a particular set of rules for knots uh, to define knot uh, i've i've always thought about this uh so uh, we have uh, uh, essentially one dimensional manifolds and um, they are getting tied up in 2d to give you these knots right 2d or mm-hmm. even 3d uh, mm-hmm. yeah. in 4d um so it's the difference between the uh, the ambient space and uh, the knots that are being like the manifolds which which the knots are being tied right so you can probably have like two two dimensional manifolds knotting up i don't know if it's if you can even picture knotting up with two dimensional stuff would uh, be, like would be like just two planes <laughs> yeah two planes two planes knotted up in 4d uh, would also result in the same equations is it is it true or mm-hmm. can you even do that uh i like okay so ultimately it boils down to uh, at least visually what i can think of is uh, you know in 3d in in 3d hmm. this uh, is the simplest knot right hmm. so hmm. when so because when two circles that are like oriented like 90 degrees to each yeah. other and uh, they are interlocked you can't escape this this is the magician's trick right? yeah. the trick of things yeah. right you yeah. can't like escape this But yeah. the moment you go to four four dimension, you can just easily uh, untie it. Like you, you can just you know you have the extra breaking the yeah you have the extra, yeah, you have the extra degree freedom so, yeah. essentially. Yeah. So with regard, regard to what you said, huh. I think knots are specifically related to like things you can do with like a one dimension with like a line, mm-hmm. kind of like with a one dimension. So when you talk about like you have. I don't know two planes not so, involved. So like when you take when you take was not involved. Uh, I think that at this point is not a question for not theory. That becomes a general question in topology. Yeah. So like, what, what topological happens? Topological invariants, fish surfaces, and stuff. Yeah. So you can, uh, you can. So the moment you talk about like a higher dimensional uh, threads, like mm, for threads. lack of better yeah, word, yeah, yeah. The moment you talk about higher dimensional threads, the problem invari- uh, invariably becomes like you have on a thread, you have some sort of like a topologically invariant surface. Mm-hmm. So in the sense, like you cannot, like you can always decompose it into a like a one dimensional string. Or a one-dimensional thread. No, no. Can you? Or like you have to project something down, right? And if you're going to project stuff, you can't. I don't think he's talking about projection. We're not exactly. Hmm. We're not exactly talking about projection. So, for example, like uh, the basic idea is to you have this, you have a two-dimensional uh, plane, and no matter how you twist it and fold it up, you can always like pick like say one center um, axis. or like one center thing where like you have like a continuous deformation of that thing that defines the entire plane hmm, hmm. so if you okay. actually think about it okay so in that sense like you can't 
necessarily like define a knot for mm-hmm. something that is the in, in a space of four uh, four dimension mm-hmm. like okay. four dimension that's fair Right. Okay. okay. Uh, so now talking about joint polynomials and like especially uh, the connection to QFT is uh, we know that QFT deals with uh, the four dimensional uh, space time, whether you take it as the Minkowski space or the Lorentzian space or whatever, whatever kind of space you take, uh, uh, you invariably talk about a four dimensional space. So now what Witten like tries to do is he tries to, uh, or like what has been attempted is like you kind of compactify the four dimensional space into a three dimensional subset. Mm. And then you talk about knots in these, which is what like, and certain invariants mm. for these knots, mm. like, so uh, what is seen as invariant mm. uh, for a particular knot. So uh, I think there is a very good uh, lecture by Ed Witten if you Google Edwitton like knot theory, I think one of the first uh, lectures is where he uh, comes up with, um, you know, this definition of knots and why exactly you're using knots. So what uh, you, uh, what you do is like uh, you have when the correlation between knots and polynomials is that your um, x square or like um, your x square or x cube, the order of the polynomial mm. uh, or the, the or degree of the term. Hmm. It corresponds to a very particular type of knot. And there are so many definite types of knots in uh, uh, like this thing. So, for example, I think uh, in three dimensions, you have like a three dimensional polynomial that can be yeah. represented, uh, like used to represent all the kinds of knots. Yeah, so, so, so in three dimensions, you can have your Jones polynomial it can be at most cubic. No, no, uh, wait, let me come back to the connection. I'm not, I've yeah. not connected it to joint polynomial yet. Mm. So what happens is like, uh, you can like, so again, lots of resources and lots of reading to be done uh, mm-hmm. to like get what I'm saying and like to go uh, for me as well. But this is the brief uh, summary that I got. So when uh, you denote like each like uh, degree of the like each term of the polynomial, you associate it with a particular knot, and then the um, the the coefficients represent something else, right? I'm not exactly entirely sure what the coefficients represent, but so they, so uh, yeah I, yeah yeah I think the combination uh, of knots. Yeah, I think um, yeah I've been reading upon it. Um, so what they say is. Uh, these Jones polynomials um, of a given knot, mm, some uh, gamma or something, can be mm-hmm. obtained when you consider uh, the Chern Simmons theory on three sphere uh, with gauge group SU2 and computing the expectation values of Wilson loops. So, uh, yeah, the, basically the gauge connection. So, okay, no, this one second, is. One second, one second. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense because your gauge connection. Yeah. Because gauge connection, especially with the loops, are computed as faces over closed paths. Yeah. If there is any non-trivial topology, it's going to come back with some winding number. Exactly. Yeah. That is so subtle. Okay, that's yeah. really cool. Yeah, and okay. I think it even connects to. I, I'm not sure about this. I'm just taking a shot in the dark. Uh, somehow, churn mm-hmm. numbers as well. Uh, I feel like it. I feel like that would be the good question to ask here, right? Like, if your coefficients have to do something with Chern numbers, then doesn't that like if you're dealing with the Chern Simmons theory, like the essence isn't the physics of the Chern Simmons theory? Yeah, the, in the, the Chern numbers. Yeah, yeah. That's and then that. you can convert that yeah. if you can somehow transform that into a question about finding coefficients of a Jones polynomial. Hmm. That makes it then a, just a not theory question. Hmm. So I think that, that that's really cool. If, yeah. if that's how so things are done, that is. Uh, yeah. So essentially, the knots are then invariant. So in the sense, no matter how you actually oh, go up and ahead true. tying the knot or like go ahead, like, you know, um, so it doesn't matter what order or like in what order you actually take the threads and tangle it up and to form a knot. But all that really matters is the essence of the structure of the knot. And that remains invariant in three dimensions. And it is classified by a polynomial, no, not the Jones polynomial. So it's just the gives you a set of like, yeah. Mm-hmm. So it just like gives you like the key, the topological information of like what your 
black field black uh, solutions look like mm -hmm. so so yeah and uh, yeah so but the interesting thing is like if you actually go ahead and then uh, you look at it uh, so you so you also have to um, like um, i think uh, written defines the action in a slightly roundabout way mm -hmm. so if you look at his paper so he defines his action instead of using the normal uh, young mills action which mm -hmm. is uh, the root that you know, you know, the colors yeah, and all that yeah, yeah, yeah. and then instead of using that he uses the churn chimmer uh, churn chimmer three form hmm. So yeah, but wasn't there an explicit about, reason for not using the yang mills equation yeah because uh, so she says like uh, we uh, we want to formulate a generally covariant theory in which all observables will be topological invariant oh ah, yeah, yeah okay i remember to... why now because when you have the yang mills when you have a yang mills lagrangian mm. it has the metric tensor within your uh, within the definition exactly. of the action exactly. right? but if you want to define something as topologically invariant you don't want your metric tensor to be in the action right. which is why he uses the churn simmons 3 form because that does not have the metric tensor in it and how is it introduced later on uh, on top of this do you uh, have uh, an idea yeah so yeah he or is it introduced at all yeah yeah he introduces the churn simmons 3 form there and then he tries to define your joint polynomials in terms of the three like the components of the i mm. mean the three form yes, yes. so in terms of a the at this time so oh, okay yeah yeah so that some like um, going into details like we'll have to spend like quite a bit of uh, right. this thing at i yeah, we can we can make a, make it a talk um, yeah, okay. this is this is really um, fascinating yeah oh it's yeah it's it's actually incredibly cool how like I don't know. I guess this would be a slight jump again in topics, but like the fact that um, all you care about in physics is really maximizing or minimizing something, or somehow getting to invariant quantities, and the invariant quantities don't even have to do with your system, as long as like the, and this becomes the more important thing in like QFTs and such is like the do you mean your huh? do you mean your invariants don't have to be observables when you mean um, they don't have to be. No, 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 like you, like okay, like classically, if you're describing motion of a ball or something, no, like uh, you would want to use like if, if you want to describe define collisions in a classical mm -hmm. setting for two balls, you'd use conservation, co conservation of momentum and conservation of energy, mm -hmm. right? But in QFT and a, like something like a churn simmons theory, your topological invariants. are not something that is explicitly part of your system it could even be of the thing But, on which your system is defined and that makes it so much cooler like for instance in quantum mechanics where do we get conservation of energy from because of translation invariants can, we get conservation of angular momentum from rotational invariants right you see okay yeah. so you you see that it's still it's inherently a part of the system right yeah it's kind of how you define system but like for us translate like yeah this is not exactly how you define the system though, because think about it when do we break translation invariants or when do we ex explicitly break uh rotational invariants like okay when mm. does that that's asking the question when does angular momentum play a role well if you switch on a magnetic field and throw an electron through it there is a preferred orientation of it And hmm. in that case, you're not affecting the system of electrons itself. You're, you're affecting the underlying space, but you're making the space such that there is certain preferred orientation. Right. So you're talking about how, like, symmetries aren't really. Mm, yeah, like symmetries aren't really things about so the system itself. You can write physical things. Exactly. Things like, it. mm. you, exactly. You can have a you can yeah. have a field which is which has some sort of a killing tensor or a killing vector. Yeah. That is, yeah. it has an inbuilt inherent uh, symmetry associated with it as well. Yeah. In yeah. fact, like yeah. what I'm trying to say is like just in non-technical terms, sometimes even without setting up your system itself, just by studying the space at which you're setting up the system. you can learn a lot more about things you trivially ex expect to be conserved or not mm -hmm. i think that's like a really really powerful statement and which actually ties back to this your in your like topological invariants 
because that defines the kind of things that can happen in your system like not the aronoff bohm effect that's a purely topological effect yeah right mm. and then that that's basically one of the motivations to define a wilson loop because wilson loop if it goes around something is not like something that is like quote unquote a singularity is going to pick up a winding number right mm -hmm. it's mm. yeah okay uh yeah while we were going through all this i went down the rabbit hole of uh, going through uh these churn numbers and wilson loops and then from wilson loops uh, i ended up at spin networks but yeah i thought this would be a, an interesting thing that we could talk about sometime oh, no let's let's go down the rabbit hole let's see what happens okay yeah so i mean it isn't really connected uh but um, i was just uh, yeah remembering of how the work i'd done on spin networks and thought this is a good idea to and it also ties in with the standard model as well uh some of uh, the stuff so i think it would be a good idea to go into it uh, at some point um sure. so you know what spin networks are right very a very basic understanding so just start from the beginning yeah you know what the spin networks mm -hmm. So you're essentially using your uh, the uh, spin operator hmm. to construct your dynamics in like uh, yeah. or like uh, uh, you're using it as like you know what your building block for yeah. all the dynamics that uh, so yeah yeah it would look like something like that of the Isaac model. Uh, I I mean because um, I mean, all you're doing there is looking at nearest neighbor spin interactions, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, you could probably say that uh, what you essentially do is like conservation of like your spin quantum numbers and these lines carry those spin quantum numbers, all of that um, stuff. And yeah, it's fascinating that way. Um, yeah, uh, we can go into it sometime. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay, it's. It, I guess it involves a bit of uh, graph theory as well. Mm, I don't graph know. Graph theory is crazy. Yeah, mm, you can you can bring in uh, graph theory? Oh, you can bring graph theory everywhere. Like, uh, for instance, I remember in my initial part of the research project, I was looking at how to um, do scalar integrals, right? Mm -hmm. And not not or rather like how to solve loop integrals that come up with Feynman diagrams. Right. And there was this one. Um, there was this one lecture, which I think was given at IHES um, by this guy at Oxford. I forget his name. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point being like that the mathematical way of defining Feynman diagrams, hmm. graph theory. Right. That's it. Right. That's all you care about. Right. Mm -hmm. um, that's how you define loops as like uh, vertices with multiple edges. Right. Mm -hmm. Or rather like more than two edges. It's yeah. how like you define a vertex where what potentially loop could start. Anyway, and then like you start, I mean, it's, it's crazy stuff. Like there are zeta functions that pop up. You have dialogues, poly, crazy functions. Mm -hmm. It's it's, oh, it's really cool. But, mm, yeah. I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that would be interesting as well. Okay, I think we this is a good place to stop. We have some key points. Uh, I'll just stop the timer and the recording. <laughs>